so I think we will go ahead and uh, uh, I have the great privilege to introduce uh, Professor Wendy Wood, uh, and it feels great uh, to have her on this uh, platform and she kindly agreed very quickly when I approached her. And uh, <clears throat> there is a lot that I can talk about her or her work, but I will be brief. Uh, Professor Wood is currently at the University of Southern California and also is a professor at Inset Business School in Paris. And more remarkably, is the author of a best-selling best -selling book, uh, Good Habits, Bad Habits, which I have not fully read, but I intend to. I have, I have ordered it. And <clears throat> what uh, YC would be very interesting, given the kind of speakers we already have had and we're going to have. The C takes a very cognitive uh, approach and break some myths, because this field uh, has some traditional uh, myths around it, uh, because most people think that they know about habits and they want to theorize around it. And that too has penetrated into the scientific uh, research that if you get into, you will know. Professor Wood's work has uh, erected a new way of uh, understanding how habits are not just formed or picked up, but how they're maintained uh, over a period of time, which is the most important thing about it. So, uh, she has written extensively and uh, lots of papers and uh, several books and has spoken widely. So if you look for her, you would find many, many videos uh, that go beyond the scope of this program. So with this, uh, I welcome you again, Wendy, for uh, your <coughs> kind. Uh, and let me speak a few words about this uh, program. We have been doing it for a while now. And the aim is to foster uh, interdisciplinary communication and encourage younger people to first to get a flavor of mind, body, culture, cognition, issues, society, a larger issues that we often don't get the time to speak in, like, you know, in usual. So we invite distinguished, very distinguished people to share their views and uh, we engage in discussions after the talks, which we will have today. So audience have uh, a chance to ask directly the questions. <laughs> and uh, we're conducting this uh, from the University of Hyderabad, which is the top research university of India. And uh, I particularly am teaching at the Center for Neural and Cognitive Science, which is a decade old center. And uh, we do interdisciplinary work in this, uh, some of these areas. And I believe that a lot of students who are currently watching and other uh, faculty in many institutions across India, this talk or talks of this type would induce in them and they can pick the new angles to study and research interesting uh, uh, avenues, which currently uh, you know, are not that popular in India because we st still do research or study traditional stuff in many uh, interdisciplinary setups even. So I believe that that is one aim to bring people of standing of global importance that can tell us uh, influence or you know we can be motivated to further uh, so with this uh, i welcome you again and we can go ahead and uh, when you can now uh, give a talk and then we'll take it from there thank and you so ahead. much that was a lovely introduction um one of the things i'm really regretting with the virus and the fact that we can't travel is that my husband and i have planned to visit india this year which obviously didn't happen. Um, but th that makes this connection particularly um, interesting to me. And I'm very grateful that you asked me to be part of this distinguished. Oh, please. Thank you. Um, and perhaps um, people listening will have questions, be able to relate their research to what I'm discussing here and contact me after the talk or during, you shouldn't hesitate to stop me during the talk. Um, and if you, I, I may not notice you if you raise your hand, but if you speak loudly, you can stop me and um, I will answer questions as I go. I'm very happy to do that. Keep in mind, that's the standard in business audiences. They always interrupt. So. <laughs> So speakers from business are used to that, so don't hesitate. All right, 
Um, after establishing those norms, let me share my screen and then we can start. I hope. Can people see it? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Fine. All right. So my research is very much at the intersection of cognition, behavior, um, uh, interventions for change. So understand that that's the intersection that I'm going to be talking about today. And in particular, I'm going to talk about why don't we stick with behavior change? This is a question we have all handled in our own lives, as well as if you do research in this area, you've certainly come up against this yourself as a researcher. So let me give you what I think of as the um, basic, the canonical example of behavior change interventions. And this was done with the five a day for better health program. It started in the US, it was adopted more broadly. It's now advocated by the World Health Organization. We said five servings a day, World Health Organization says 400 grams a day. We should all be eating more fruits and vegetables. So the program, <clears throat> program was mostly an educational program. Uh, it put ads, put out ads explaining that we should do this, put stickers on fruits and vegetables. There were supermarket programs, programs in schools. And it was really effective in changing our beliefs. So in surveys, before the program was instituted, 8% of people in the US thought that they should be eating five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And after the program had been going for about four years, 35%, over a third, recognized that they should be eating five servings a day. And that's a huge shift. And any intervention that generated that sort of change would be counted as a success. Except that the intervention wasn't meant to just change people's beliefs. It was also designed to change their behavior. And here it just failed utterly. So before the program, 11% of people in the US were eating five servings a day. 10 years later, still 11%. And since then it's even gone down. So why is this? Well, I'm going to argue that part of this is because the program focused on our knowledge and our conscious decisions, which is what we think drive choices like what we eat. And that is true. I don't need to argue it's not true. Of course it's true. When we stop to think, when we take the time to make a decision. But eating is something we do on a regular basis. We do it repeatedly so that we form habits. It doesn't depend on our conscious decision-making. And that's the problem with the intervention is the five-a-day program changed our beliefs about what we should do, but it didn't necessarily change our behavior. It wasn't designed to do that. The program, the, the program initiators didn't realize that that was a separate problem. So we brought this, so this is just my story. You can accept it or not. We brought this challenge into the lab and tried to demonstrate causal evidence that habits impede attitude change. And, sorry, that habits impede behavior change, despite changing people's attitudes. So this is a study <clears throat> that I did with several collaborators in which we delivered a persuasive message, convincing people that consuming sugar is unhealthy. And that's an easy case to make, right? <laughs> sugar is a health risk. So it changed our participants' attitudes toward consuming sugar. After reading the message, 
they thought they should be consuming less sugar. Then we gave them an opportunity to participate in a taste test, where it, which was supposedly totally unrelated, where they could choose bottles of things to taste, drinks to taste. And some of the drinks had sugar in them, some didn't. We also assessed their habit strength for choosing each of those beverages in daily life. And we assessed how much sugar they consume. Now keep in mind, everyone has changed their attitudes. There were no difference in attitude change between people who typically drink sugar and do it automatically, report that that choice is automatic, and people who reported that they don't have habits to consume a lot of sugar. But this is what influenced their behavior. You can see that people with weak habits continue to act consistently with their new attitudes. People with strong habits though, even though they had changed their attitudes, they continued to um, choose sugared vegetables. And this happened only specifically in one condition that is likely to promote habit performance. And that is when participants were mentally fatigued and they weren't actively controlling their choices. And that's what we would anticipate. I had anticipated that, that's why we manipulated it. Habits are the fallback when people are not thinking about what to do and controlling their behavior actively. So what we concluded from this study is that changing habits is not the same as changing attitudes. That our, our habits, our actual repeated behavior doesn't depend on our information, what education we've had on our preferences. But habits are controlled Habits are not something that you have to do. You can control them by exerting executive control, which is something we don't always do in daily life. So what does activate? What does activate and control our habits? Here again, I'll use an example. Um, habits form from repetition. So if you start a new job and you have to figure out how to get to work, you might decide, well, okay, I'll take a train. And then there's lots of decisions involved. You have to figure out what time should you leave home? You have to find a transit stop. You have to figure out what route to take. So your intentions and decisions are very involved initially. But as you repeat the same behavior over and over, it becomes cued by the context that you're in. For me, I get up in the morning, I take a shower, I check the time, I get a cup of coffee, and then I just get on the train as I always have. I don't think about what train to take or how to get to work. Once you've formed that habit, you can just continue doing it as it's cued by the context that you're in. And it's not just simple actions that are cued by habits in this way. There's a great study with firefighter training, and we know that that starts with education. It starts with providing lots of um, experience and training in how to put out fires. In fact, firefighters practice in what they call burn buildings. So they just keep setting these buildings on fire and putting the fire out. Interviews with experienced firefighters showed that their decision-making, their thought processes changed radically with experience. They are not thinking through how to make decisions. And these researchers were trying to figure out what the decisions were, but they didn't find any. In tracking what firefighters do, 
they respond, it seems, very much on habit. So they looked for cues. What direction is the wind blowing? How hot are the flames? What color is the flames? What's the layout of the building? Where are people likely to be? Is there likely to be somebody who um, needs particular help in the building? And from those cues, they just automatically do whatever has worked in the past. So even in firefighting, if you practice a behavior over and over, the response comes to be activated by cues. And this was called recognition primed decisions. I would call it context primed decisions. And they're not even really decisions. It's just responding. There's no decision tree involved. So some of the first work I did what in this area was to figure out, okay, so if habits are a thing, how much of our behavior is habitual? And we conducted an episode sampling study where we followed a bunch of people for several days and we, we contacted them, we beeped them, they were wearing watches, we beeped them every hour and had them report what they were doing, where they were, what they were thinking. And what we found is that 43% of the time, people were doing the same thing in the same situation that they did pretty much every day. And most of the time they were thinking about something other than what they were doing, suggesting that they're responding automatically because their behavior is just running off without them making a conscious decision to do so. One of the other things we found in this study is that habits apply very broadly to a wide range of behavior. So people respond in this way, even when they're doing schoolwork, sitting in class, even when they're watching TV or scrolling on um, social media on the web, when they're cleaning, sleeping, exercising, they all tend, consciousness recedes when people repeat behaviors on a regular basis in the same context. And people are able to respond in the same way they did in the past. Okay, defining habits. I think of habits as mental shortcuts. They're context response associations that form in memory. That is associations between the context that you're in and the context can include a variety of things, right? It could be the location. So you might have a habit of checking your cell phone, getting on social media whenever you are taking the bus to school. Um, that context activates that response in memory, brings it to mind, and allows you then, gives you this shortcut to repeat the actions that worked for you in the past. And this is because habits develop as people repeat responses that are rewarding in some way. And this has to do with the activation of dopamine. You, dopamine ties together contexts and responses and memory and helps to form this kind of association that then is available to guide our behavior. Sometimes these are called cached associations, cached memories but they are, it is the direct retrieval of a response given perception of a context. Okay, we do have some direct, some, some evidence that people respond based on these context response associations. And our first study was done actually with habitual runners. So we took people who ran on a regular basis and. Um, we asked them, what is the location where you typically run? 
And we use that then in a priming task to see, this was done several weeks later, to see how quickly running came to mind when people were primed with the locations in which they typically ran. And suggesting that these runners had context response habits, once the location was primed, thoughts of running automatically came to mind. They came to mind very quickly. Now, this was very interesting to us because we had already also asked our participants for their goals for running. And again, this was done several weeks earlier. We asked participants for their goals for running and they listed things that you'd expect. So things like um, relaxation, fitness, weight control, when primed with goals, our regular runners didn't think of running. So it's as if the context activated running, but the goals that they reported for running, and these are their personal goals. We tailored all the goals, just like the context, to each participant. Their goals for running didn't bring running to mind. In fact, goals for running brought running to mind mostly for participants who were only occasional runners. And that suggested to us, we hadn't anticipated this, but that suggested to us that people who are occasional runners have to motivate themselves to get out there in ways that habitual runners don't. So for the occasional runners, goals are tied to running. For habitual runners, it's the context that's tied to running that activates thoughts of running. To see whether this, this story, again, I'm telling you stories, to see whether there's any causal evidence for this story, we had to take things into the lab um, and we tested how people formed habits in a very simple children's game. This is, you're actually watching a screenshot of someone play the game. It's a sushi making game. And as you can see, there's an avatar who tells people what to, to use, what, what ingredient to use next. And all of the ingredients have to be used in a specific order. So it's like a sequential response task, right? There are 16 steps in this particular um, game and participants had to repeat each in the right order. So they practice this either 10 times or two times. Now our 10 times participants, that was enough for them to form a pretty strong habit because the game is so simple. Um, Two times they only just learn the very basics of the game and we're still having to make decisions about what to do next. Okay, again, stop me if any of this is not clear. In order to test the strength of habits directly, right? So we're manipulating practice 10 times or two times at the game, but in order to assess the strength of context response associations directly, we used a priming task where participants were primed with one step in the recipe, and then they were given a choice between two items that were the next step. And we assessed how quickly they thought of the right step after being primed with the prior one. And what we found, as you'd expect, is that people who have only practiced twice, who are still making decisions and having to think about what to do, took much longer in this priming task. So this is in the cognitive associations task. They took longer to make those decisions than people who had practiced more often and formed stronger habits. But the interesting thing for us was the question, okay, so we've got people to um, practice different amounts. We've shown that it then influences their, um, 
the, the speed at which the res correct response comes to mind, it's not that much of a surprise. What we were interested in really is whether those associations that people had learned through practice would facilitate later performance. So it would lead to the kind of persistence that you see with habit performance. And so we had participants complete a second part of the study where they had to make sushi by themselves with no instructions. And what we found is that participants who practiced only twice, they were much worse at this than participants who had practiced 10 times. Again, that's not all that surprising. What was important for us to demonstrate is that the number of practice trials influenced successful repetition through the speed of mental cueing, okay? So more practice, stronger habit associations in the cueing task, the priming task, and that's what led to successful performance when people were trying to do the task themselves. It's what allowed people to persist. Now, as an additional feature of the study, we wanted to see whether maybe people's motivations and goals, maybe it's that people are, who are really motivated to do this task, we're really having fun with it and people did enjoy it. Um, maybe those are the ones who are successful at repeating the task and that wasn't the case. So intentions to repeat the task accurately, to be correct, liking for the task, fluency, perceived fluency, how fluent the task felt, how difficult it was, and even perceived automaticity did not predict, did not account for the effects of practice on successful repetition. Instead, only speed of mental cueing, only the habit strength variable could account for those effects. So <laughs> to give a brief summary, once formed, habits are activated by context cues. We have manipulated these, manipulated habit strength through the amount of practice. We've assessed it, sometimes through context response associations. We have assessed future repetition. And in this particular study, we found that the prior step in the sequence brought the practice response to mind. And participants who had practiced a lot weren't more motivated to act on the response in mind. Instead, it seemed to be much more of an ideomotor effect, which was identified early on by William James. Um, he argued that every mental representation of an action awakens to some degree the actual movement, which is its object. So, <laughs> fancy words bit flowery way of stating this, but what he's saying is when we have actions in mind, that activates the response program associated with that action. And in this study, repetition didn't depend on motivation or perception. Okay. So, there are a couple of implications for, of this perspective on habit. Um, and one is that our habits are going to be activated broadly by context cues, even when we hold attitudes that are somewhat different from our habits. And one study we did to illustrate this that I think is, um, is, is a good demonstration of this phenomenon was done in a local movie cinema. So we got the owners of the cinema to allow us to show videos, short videos before a, a movie. So these are just people who showed up expecting to go to a movie. And then we showed them some short videos before they 
started watching the feature film. Supposedly to thank them for doing this, um, we gave them a box of popcorn and half got a box of fresh popcorn and half got a box of stale popcorn. Now the stale popcorn was really stale. It had sat in, a, in our lab room for a week in a plastic bag. So it was pretty awful. And all of our participants, we had them rate the popcorn and we all said they hated the stale popcorn and they liked the fresh popcorn, it was fine. They appreciated it as a gift. The stale popcorn they didn't appreciate. So you'd expect, because people don't like the stale popcorn, that they'd eat less of it. And that's indeed what I'm showing you here, that with the stale popcorn, people ate less than half of the box. With the fresh popcorn, they ate about 70%. And we weighed the boxes when we retrieved them so that this is based on percent weight consumed. But note that this is just people who don't have habits to eat popcorn in the movie cinema. Because as I said, we asked our participants their habits to eat popcorn in the movie cinema. People who had strong habits to eat popcorn in the movie cinema continued to eat popcorn, whether it was fresh or stale. They could tell us they hated the stale popcorn and they did, it was awful, but they still ate it. They were in a cinema context and they just ate it. So habits are cued despite our current desires. And this happens, we think, because habit memories are a relatively separate learning system. They have a relatively separate neural basis, system of neural connections, and they're a relatively separate memory system that forms and changes slowly only through doing, not through our decisions. So those habit memories, you can inhibit and control them, but you can't change them by making a decision. The habit memory will still be there. You can change habits though by changing contacts. And so in the same experiment, we brought people into a meeting room on campus where they were watching a music video in a darkened room. So we made it as similar as possible to a movie theater. And we again gave some participants fresh popcorn, we gave others stale popcorn, just like we had in the movie theater. And we found that everyone, it didn't matter what their habits were to eat popcorn in the movie theater, everyone ate more fresh than stale popcorn. And there wasn't any difference between the weak and the strong habit cinema popcorn eaters. So it's not the case that people with habits to eat popcorn in the cinema like it more, and so are more motivated to eat even bad popcorn. Instead, it's context. They're responding to context. And if you um, follow the cognitive literature, as I know you guys do, um, this is an illustration of a double dissociation, right? So we have the palatability of the popcorn influencing people who have weak habits, but not strong. And then we have the context in which people are eating influencing people with strong habits and not weak. Okay. So that supports this idea that habits are a relatively separate system. Double dissociations are, are used to demonstrate that one system is influenced by one set of factors, another system is influenced by another set. So contacts are a way of activating our habits. They bring our habits to mind, but they're also a means of controlling our habits. 
And that was illustrated, I think, most powerfully with anti-smoking campaigns. Now, in the US, the history of smoking has gone something like this. Um, in the 1950s, we figured out, hmm, smoking is not good for us. And then there was the Surgeon General's report that came out in 65. And after that, policymakers started to take control of smoking. And they did some things that were really smart. Yes, there were educational campaigns, other sorts of things, but they actually made it more difficult for people to smoke. So they started taxing cigarettes. They removed TV commercials and they actually removed cigarettes off of store shelves. So in the US, in order to buy cigarettes, you have to go up to a store clerk and ask for the pack you want now. We also have smoking bans in public places. So you can't smoke in the office, you can't smoke in restaurants, any public building, smoking is banned. And all of these things added friction to smoking. So made it so that people had to make decisions about could they afford cigarettes? How do they buy them? Where can they smoke them? And all of that friction reduced smoking considerably so that you can see this is the per capita consumption of cigarettes. Right now, the US, only 15% of the population smokes. Used to be close to 50, and that's a major shift. Okay, this whole idea of friction, I think you can trace to a number of different sources, but one important source is Kurt Lewin's field theory. He argued that people's behavior is controlled by forces that are very similar to the forces in physics. And friction in physics is a force that opposes motion. Lewin applied this to behavior change and argued that to change behavior, we really need to either change the forces that drive us, which is what most behavior change interventions do at this point, right? They try to convince you that you want to do something else, that you should do something other than what you're doing now. So they're trying to set up internal forces that will move you forward towards the more desirable, healthy, productive, happier behavior. Or Lewin recognized you can set restraining forces that keep us from acting. And these are sometimes described as barriers. But what was so important in Lewin's analysis is that he saw these forces in the environment as well as inside us. And psychologists in general focus on the forces inside us and we forget the um, corresponding forces that are out in our living environments that also influence our behavior. So what if we took these um, external forces seriously, what would they look like? Well, let me give you an example. This was a study done um, with cell phones, tracking how far people went to a paid fitness center. Right? Our cell phones are being tracked for all kinds of things. This is 7.5 million cell phones <laughs> were tracked how far did they go to paid gymnasiums, paid fitness centers in for this, the phones were tracked for two months. And what these moving figures are supposed to demonstrate is that on average, if cell phones and obviously the people holding them went to the gym, sorry, went to a gym that was about three and a half miles from their home they went five times a month on average. 
if people went to a gym that was five miles from their home, they only went once on average. So distance is huge friction on our behavior. We all think we go to the gym because we want to. <laughs> we make a decision, we're gonna go work out, we're going to actually be good to ourselves, we'll go. But what this study shows is that distance is friction. That if you choose a gym that is far away, you are less likely to go than people who have chosen a gym that is closer to them. Okay. Again, I'm telling you stories, so you want causal evidence of this. I have evidence for time. This is a very old study that was done to try to convince people to take the stairs and not use the elevator. So the researchers did just what all of us would do which is they put signs up all over the elevator. It's the first thing they did. They tried to inform people, burn calories, not electricity. It's good for your health. It's good for the environment. Take the stairs, not the elevator. And this, by the way, was a four-story office building. So people could easily take the stairs. They just weren't. The signs had no effect. So the researchers thought, well, what can we, we do to actually change people's behavior? They decided to add friction. They delayed the closing of the door by 16 seconds. And when they did that, they cut elevator trips by a third, which is really surprising. That's a very powerful manipulation. Just that friction of waiting for the door to close convinced people to take the stairs instead. What was lovely about this study is that the researchers had the closing door manipulation for four weeks and then put the elevator back to normal. So it was back to its normal door closing speed. Still, elevator use was reduced because people had formed in those four weeks, had formed a habit to use the stairs and they weren't even thinking about the elevator anymore. So they weren't testing out whether it was now back to its regular speed. They just took the stairs and didn't fuss with it. So they formed habits. So this friction not only got people to change their behavior, but it also got them to form new habits, which is lovely. There's a bunch of evidence on this from other experimental studies. Um, this one specifically is about distance, although it's not distance traveled to a gym, it's distance between you and food that is very tempting, but maybe not very healthy. You can, if you want to take an educational approach, inform people about what is good to eat and what's not, we all know that doesn't work. We all know what we shouldn't be doing. We're just not doing it always. Um, or we can add friction. And this is from a meta-analysis that looked at the distance that food was positioned from someone working in an office. And what they found is that with more distance, people ate significantly less of the tempting but unhealthy food than when there was the food was really close to them. Okay, so distance works, time works as friction on behavior. You can use friction to um, affect many behaviors. Hand hygiene is one that we're now more concerned about than ever. Um, and you can inform people, right, that you should be, they should be washing their hands. It doesn't have a whole lot of an effect, but in a study that actually removed friction to help people use hand sanitizer, people were more likely 
to do the right thing and use the sanitizer. So this was actually done in a hospital and it was moving hand sanitizers around the room to see if they could increase the likelihood that physicians would use hand sanitizer before and after seeing a patient. And if the sanitizer was very easily accessible, so there was little friction, physicians are, were much more likely to use it than when it was not accessible, not easily accessible. And in some ways, these data are really surprising because you'd expect physicians in a hospital to be constantly concerned about hand hygiene, right? There's huge um, educational campaigns on how important it is. But instead, all of these people who should have been really concerned about it were influenced by the accessibility of the sanitizer. They were, they were influenced by friction. Okay, my last example um, is a study that was done with medical compliance. How do you get people to take, take pills? Um, if we're gonna use habit science, understanding of habits, to get people to adhere more, we could try to convince people of the efficacy of these medications, or we could try to habituate, make them to habitize um, the behavior so that it becomes automatic. And in a study that Alison Phillips did to figure out to take medication, people's beliefs didn't have any effect on whether they actually took medication regularly. Importance of medication for their health, concern about side effects, that had no effect. What did have an effect is whether people took it as part of a routine so that they were taking it at the same time every day. It was their habit that led to adherence. So, in summary, why don't we stick with behavior change? It's because context around us cue old habits and keep those habits coming to mind so that we keep acting on them. One way to control unwanted habits is to add friction because that can disrupt the automaticity, slows and stops the repetition of old behaviors, old behavior patterns. And particularly in the current environment, we are all concerned about forming new habits to keep ourselves safe. Um, so my recommendation is that you make it as easy as possible for yourself to use a mask hang it on your door, leave extras in, in your car, in your backpack, so that you always have one available and that you keep sanitizer handy. So these are low friction behaviors that you're gonna be able to repeat easily into habits. Thank you. That's my talk. Thanks, thanks a lot for a very interesting uh, talk with uh, very vivid uh, examples. I almost imagine myself eating uh, the popcorns that are not so good. So uh, I noticed that you have carried out a lot of experiments in, in the real world, as opposed to what we keep doing in the laboratories, which we can't do now. So uh, how, how you could uh, do them? It must have taken a lot of uh, managing and convincing. Uh, and you still probably do those kind of experiments, at least before the COVID. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, we are all online right now. You're right. We are all definitely online. So our challenge has been how to find ways to build habits online. So we started studying social media, people's media use habits. Um, we have, we're, we're using um, 
games, different types of computer games that form habits. We are at this point limited just as you are by online behavior, but it's very possible to study habits online just like it is in the real world. And yes, I think it's very important for um, researchers to both demonstrate causality and demonstrate process under controlled conditions, as well as illustrate, as well as use those insights to help to explain some real world challenges that we're having. And I try to do both in my work. Uh, I was reading uh, one of your interviews. Uh, maybe it was a student who was asking some questions and you told that when you started uh, thinking of uh, and you were interested in the very real world scenario where people don't uh, uh, you know, get into good habits, they cannot maintain habits. And that was uh, one trigger for you to take up. Was this true? Uh, was this a real motivation to devote all your life to uh, this, 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 this very question? Why we can't maintain good habits? Uh, even if yeah. So, so it didn't start off, I didn't start off thinking, I'm going to be a habit researcher, because there was no such thing. There was, people don't study habits. Um, what I thought was that I was trained initially to, to um, study attitude change and how attitudes guide behavior. And what became clear early on was that you can change people's attitudes but that won't necessarily translate into their behavior. And so that's the question that I became interested in is, so why is behavior so difficult to change? And why does it seem not to have the same trajectory as attitudes? Um, so that's the thing that led me then to study habits. I came at it by asking a more basic question, and then this was the answer that I kept coming up against. It's repeated regular behavior that doesn't change. Okay, well, while I was going through the literature, and obviously many other researchers, uh, Angela Duckworth and many others, they come in, and uh, one thing appeared to me that contradiction to popular notions that people not necessarily have enough self-control of, you know, self-control and good habits are not necessarily, they go together. Interestingly, on the other, other hand, that you don't probably need all that inventory control to maintain or culture good habits. Is that really true? It's because if a lot of people think, no, no, I need to have a lot of control, you know, every day waking up at five and going to run and it requires control. How can you say that, you know, it can, so how, how that really, yeah, so there's been a real shift in our understanding. That's a great question. There's been a real shift in our understanding of what self-control is in the last few years. And you're right, some of this is Angela's work. Um, we used to think that people were successful in life when they were really good at exerting control. And that's based on based on Walter Michel's research with four-year-olds, right? Some seem to be able to wait for two marshmallows, others weren't. Yeah. Some, some have self-control early on, others don't. Um, and we even made up scales to measure self-control so we can see dispositionally how much people have. That's what we found by observing people who have high levels of self-control is that they're not actively inhibiting or controlling their behavior at all. Instead, they are really good at forming habits that meet their goals. Mm -hmm. But we all have habits. You know, we, <laughs> this is a basic learning mechanism. But people who have good self-control form habits that work for them. So they have habits that allow them to be productive. They have habits to keep them exercising. Um, all of these are sort of part of the, the repertoire of people with good self-control. And if you go back to that Michelle original research, um, it's very interesting 
because there's an undiscussed manipulation in that work mm. that it's this new theory of self-control. Something that people don't talk about, which is something that Michelle did is he took a pie tin and put it over the marshmallow for some of the kids. So the kids could lift up the tin and eat the marshmallow anytime they wanted to while they were waiting. But the, the lid was on it. And if the marshmallow was covered like this, the majority of kids could wait, which goes along with the whole idea that self-control is really how you organize your environment rather than who you are as a person. And that got no play. I think that's the most interesting finding from the Michelle study. The kids could, and some did, lift up the tin but most didn't because if you control your environment to put friction on the behaviors you don't want to engage in, then you're able to meet your goals. Uh, one last question. Uh, it's uh, often written in this literature that uh, we don't have, you know, if we uh, pick something as a strong habit, then we lose consciousness as if we are on an automatic, uh, you know, kind of engine that uh, gets started because of this cue environment and reward uh, relations. Even once it gets started, it gets started. And so uh, that brings us uh, the other elephant in the room. Uh, could it be the, infle the inflexibility of it? Uh, that you can't, uh, you can't control uh, even if it uh, needs to be controlled in some scenarios because if it gets too automatized, um, that is though some research on this issue and mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know what, is this really that inflexible that we lose conscious awareness, that we don't feel anything about it, we don't, uh, we just do it because it's a habit, good or bad. Yes, and some of the, <laughs> I do think it works that way. Um, some of the work we're doing right now is to try to understand how people interpret their own habits. Because we all have a strong need to feel like we're in control. We all have a belief in our own agency, our own decision-making. And what we show in our most recent work is that even though behavior is triggered by habit, we often interpret it as actually due to our own decisions and our own control. The behavior is running off but we don't recognize that that's happening. We don't realize how often we're responding in that way. So that's one answer to your question. So that's the yes, it's as bad as you think. The second answer though, is that many behaviors require both habit and conscious decisions, right? So um, all of you, have writing habits, studying habits, otherwise you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be in this position. So you have habits to work at certain times or in certain ways, um, but that habit doesn't get the work done, right? You have a habit, but you also have to do the creative work, the thinking on top of it. So many of our behaviors are a combination of habit and more thoughtful, um, uh, deliberate control. So to that extent, we are in control of our behavior because habit has to integrate with other systems. And we are, some of those systems are executive control, affect, decision-making systems, yeah. My last point, and it's connected to my own, I consider myself as a man of rigid habits. and. Sometimes when I don't perform those things, I feel bad when I come back. So which means my amygdala, my semantic nervous system, my emotions about that work, that they're, they're, they're somehow are active, even though they're automatized in themselves. So there is a phenomenological relationship uh, to these rigid habits. I feel guilty that I haven't done it for a couple of days. There's a sense of, uh, 
uh, guilt associated with uh, not everything, but the ones that I really do all the time. And I have been good with them and productive. So does this really happen to people? You have seen many people, good, bad. Uh, that they well, are. I, there, there's two answers to that question. One is that um, we like our habits. I mean, even our bad habits are familiar. They're understandable. They're predictable. And people like those kinds of experiences. But the second answer is that's that guilt, that bad feeling, I missed something, I didn't do the, the thing, the, the right thing that I've trained myself to do. That's an inference after the fact. That's like, it doesn't mean that that's what drove the behavior, mm. right? It doesn't mean that that's what caused you to do it. And the, it's an inference you made once you realize we all are observing our behavior and making inferences about who we are, what our motives are, whether we've lived up to our standards. So it's an inference you're making after the fact, much like people take um, responsibility for their own habits much more than they should. Doesn't mean that's what drives it. All right, I could go on with a lot of uh, interesting questions. Uh, audience, if they have any questions, kindly uh, go ahead and please identify yourself who you are, a student or a faculty, it would help us to know. And please show up on video uh, because it's, yeah. Well, there's one question from, from Mishra. How do you say the first name? I don't want to say it wrong. Three, yeah. Yes. How does nudge influence how does nudge influence counter habits? Nudges can be like friction and impede behavior. In fact, I think in, um, in the book Nudge, they talk about some of the limits on smoking that I mentioned as nudges to get people to quit. You know, if there's, so for example, when I was younger, there used to be smoking sections on airplanes, which oh, is yeah. hard to believe now, <laughs> which sort of makes it okay to smoke. So if you're in an airplane, then it's okay to smoke. But now everything is non-smoking. And so people are being nudged to be abstinent from smoking while they're on an airplane. And that helps decrease smoking rates more broadly. You can't do it and have to make decisions, then it's a problem. Okay, another one. If I want to get away with the habit of not checking my WhatsApp, what should I do? <laughs> this is a real issue for many people simply because Silicon Valley and the, um, the technicians that put together social media, that put together our cell phones, know a lot about habit and have leveraged it to create technologies that are really habit forming in very interesting ways. It's a, it's a fascinating, I think, um, demonstration of how to use psychology. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's using psychology in ways that don't work well for us. So, oh. um, or stop thinking that people are really interested in talking to you all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be lovely if that changed the rewards for yeah. using WhatsApp. But you get, you get those rewards and you form those visual patterns and it's hard to get yourself to stop. So what I always recommend is you add friction. You can add friction by taking the WhatsApp icon off your phone, right? You can take it off your computer so that you have to actually search for it each time and log in each time you want to use it. That's friction. You can not take your phone with you sometimes. I know that's radical, um, but you can actually leave it at home and you'll be fine. Or if you are 
in a meeting or at a meal and you don't want to be checking your phone, you will find that you do it much less often if you put it in your pocket or you put it in your coat so that you have to reach for it. If your phone is sitting there in front of you, it is cueing you to use it. And WhatsApp sends out all of these um, messages and um, beeping that cues you additionally. So control the cues, remove the phone, or even better, leave it at home. That's my answer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's a third question if we have time. I don't know how much time people have. Can habits influence sustainable behavior? Is it possible to modify habits to adopt sustainable behavior? Yeah, it is definitely possible. Um, but again, you need to add friction to the behaviors that you're trying to, to change. It's not, most of us have habits to do things like um, buy water in plastic bottles. So trying to find ways to make it easier for yourself to bring a thermos or bring your own reusable bottle. So it's always there. So you don't, you're reducing friction on using the um, beneficial, the beneficial option. I actually learned that I have a thermos that somebody gave me as a gift that's insulated. And that is so wonderful. It's so rewarding because it keeps things cold throughout the day in ways that plastic bottles don't. So I now have formed a habit that was so rewarding. I now have formed a habit to take that bottle with me when I go hiking or I go out. And um, I'd rather do that than buy a water bottle. So find some way to disrupt those unwanted behaviors and to make it easier to do ones that are really good for you. Okay, are there any other uh, questions from any audience? Well, there's one more here. So let me do this one more. I suppose motor tasks that we are habituated to are done without our conscious awareness. So is it possible for us to multitask, acting on a motor habit and doing a mental task simultaneously? And does habit formation have a basis in neuroplasticity? It's a great question. Yes, habit formation does have a basis in um, neuroplasticity in the sense that um, you can form connections every time you are doing, you're repeating an activity, you are strengthening the habit memory trace in the neural system. Um, so is it possible to multitask? Well, we do it all the time. If you multitask, you are though going to probably be doing one task that is thoughtful and one task that is automatic. And that is even the ha habitual task takes a small amount of conscious monitoring often, which is why we have trouble talking on the cell phone while driving, because driving is largely habitual, but as I said, habits integrate with other systems. So there is a small drain on conscious awareness when you are driving, and that interferes with a more thoughtful task like talking on the phone. So you get some residual interference, um, but multitasking is possible if you have a simple enough habit, it's easy to do for simple habits. It's a long-winded answer to that question, but anyhow, it's a good question. <laughs> right, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Oh. Uh, what I, my question is, if you're trying to can we get into a habit of doing something difficult or something that you are not an expert in or good at? What do you think would be an effective way to do it if you can't get immediate rewards out of the practice? You want to give me an example? 
uh, if let's say I am, I don't know how to drive a car, and I am trying to learn, and going to a academy would be too costly or effective. I mean, it's too far. I would take more effort. So, what do you think would be a way to drive myself every day to go and learn? Yeah, so that sounds like a skill learning question. It's not so much a habit repetition question. So once you have learned the skill, you've developed habits that you can respond to, but, but you need to continually sort of slightly modify your behavior as be, you become more and more of an expert. So it's going to take a period of thought and um, control over your behavior while you're learning the right thing to do and continually modifying your response. So I don't know that that's a habit question so much as you have to keep bolstering yourself and telling yourself that the task is worth learning and convincing yourself to be optimistic that you will be able to learn it. Um, so, yeah, so I think the initial learning process is very thoughtful for some, for a complex task like that. But once you've learned it, then you can respond habitually and yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. This was lovely. I, as I said, if people have questions, research that's relevant, I'd love to talk to you further. Um, and maybe at some point, once this virus craziness is over, or once we've learned to cope with it better, then um, perhaps I will be able to meet you in person. Sure, welcome. more than welcome. And uh, uh, that would be great. And we, uh, just to tell you, University of Hyderabad is one of the institutions of eminence, one of the select, you can sort of think of Ivy League uh, public you know, now we recently have got that, that allows us to broadly internationalize our activities uh, at multiple levels. But this came at the time when we, even if we have the money, we can't do that. So yeah. all these exchanges and uh, interesting things should be happening with this new uh, tag to the university. So we look forward to distinguished scholars uh, like you to come over here and spend time. That and would be cool. will be uh, interested. And, yes. And some of the students who are uh, uh, here, many of them are graduate students and uh, many of them are completing PhD. Maybe uh, they would like to write to Wendy if they have any other ideas and she so would uh, advise them. So, I'd love to hear, yes. So I think that we should uh, call it a day here and with this, uh, the. There are many, many questions. Uh, there is a question I, I can see from a student that some, for some people it's very easy and for other people it's very difficult. What might be the reason? I think she already has answered that in many, many ways. Uh, obviously, I think personally we still don't know really what makes someone stick to the habits with willpower or other people that keep doing when they move out of the city or change jobs. Uh, you know, you said the friction changes, the, the, then everything changes and they can't come back. Yes. Or, you know, environment plays a very key role in getting them. And I'm not even touching the scenario when it becomes disease, like obsessive compulsive disorder. You want the same triggers, the same cues, the same people, the same faces, the same buildings in order to function even. So mm -hmm. that is a negative side too. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely a downside. Yeah. There's a, as any learning system, it benefits us as well, as well as challenges us. Yep. So finally, I think see already talked about masks and COVID and we are all now learning new habits. And hopefully these are not actually bad habits, let them be there, except the, the deaths and the tragedies. You know, the, because India already, you know, with, the current prime minister who, when he came into power maybe eight years ago, one of the agendas was cleanliness. And he did a lot of public talking, spending money. I'm not evaluating how far it has helped, but it certainly went further. 
So cleanliness became a dozen drive. And legislations and awards and money, all, all that happened for eight years. So now that we are facing this, that must be at least consciously playing some role in. We already know what to do. So let's get into so it's not very difficult, except that I see people without masks and at all times here in a metropolitan big, apparently uh, a city with high literacy rates. Uh, so nevertheless, we are all creatures of some other habits. So thank you, Wendy, finally for taking your time and it was a lovely to talk to you and you answered all questions very gracefully. And uh, if any audience has any question, then we would share her details. It's already there. You can write to her. Are you writing any new book? Given uh, no, I'm not. I'm focusing on collecting data for a bit. Um, writing a book was a very um, time-consuming. Took me away from the lab. Certainly. So I want to be back in the lab again. <laughs> All right, wish you a very good day ahead in Washington. And we are signing off in India with Diwali. Is it today Diwali or tomorrow? I'm, we are both two days, I think. Now, the firecrackers and the celebration with lights. Thanks, everyone. And see you pretty soon with the other next speaker is Ray Jackendorf, a very important name in cognitive science. 20th, and all of you will get the invitations. And do join us and spread around the world. Thank you. And happy Diwali. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone.